Good afternoon. My name is David Ruffin, Chair of the North Carolina Historical Commission, and I want to welcome the public, of course, as well as Commission members and, and pertinent staff uh, to our September 3rd meeting of the Historical Commission. Um, I want to remind that uh, since we are under the mandates of statutory requirements for virtual meetings during uh, a, a period of emergency, um, we have to have all uh, speakers to identify themselves one and that any votes that are taken must be taken by roll call. Uh, I will ask, since the agenda has certainly been published and, and attended material associated with the agenda have been provided to all members of the commission uh, previous to this meeting, uh, ask for any indication of a conflict of interest by any commission member at this point. Mr. Ruffin, I need to uh, recruit myself of voting on the acquisitions of the Museum of Albemarle. Commissioner Barbara Snowden has uh, asked for recusal on the acquisitions to the commission uh, to the uh, Museum of the Albemarle. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Snowden. At this point, I will call the roll uh, of the historical commission. Yeah. Yes. Is uh, anyone? Uh, uh, Dave Denari. Uh, yes, Dr. Denari. Uh, I, I see that there is one item here. Uh, maybe it's just a report from Tryon Palace. Uh, I don't think it's an action item, uh, uh, but I am uh, uh, involved with the uh, uh, Tryon Palace on the uh, uh, foundation board and also uh, uh, chair of the African-American Advisory Committee. Uh, and I just saw this report from uh, uh, Bill McCray, uh, the executive director. I don't think it's an action item. So uh, I don't think I will need to recuse myself for that. Councillor Fagan, I, I agree. It doesn't appear since there is no specific action required. These are reports, as I understand, from the uh, respective if, directors. If it's only a report, there's nothing to recuse from. If there were a vote on accessions, then it may be something, but, yes. but not I, just for the report. I agree. So uh, let's proceed with the formal roll call. Dr. Mary Lynn Braun. Here. Uh, Mr. Sam Dixon. Here. Dr. David Denard. Here. Dr. Valerie Johnson. Here. Dr. Melinda Lowry. Mr. Perry Morrison. Here. Mr. Noah Reynolds. Here. Ms. Susan Phillips. I thought I saw Ms. She's Phillips. muted. She, she may be muted. Um, but I believe she. Yes, I'm, this is Susan Phillips. I'm here and I was Thank muted. Uh, Ms. Barbara Snowden. I'm here. Dr. Darren Waters. Here. David Ruffin, present. Okay, I will. Let's then move uh, as is uh, the normal protocol to. Uh, consideration and approval of the minutes for the May 29th meeting of the Historical Commission. Uh, it again has been provided to you in detail. Uh, I ask if there's any uh, edits, modifications, comments, what have you. Uh, Susan Phillips, I move to approve the minutes from the previous meeting. Commissioner uh, Phillips has uh, moved approval of the minutes. Do I hear I a will second? I will second that. Dr. Denard, um, and this is going to be a little bit laborious, but we need to do this. So I have to call the roll David, or even acceptance. Allow yes. me to jump in if I may. Uh, this is Parker yes. Backstrom. Uh, yes. Mr. Morrison had emailed me uh, just prior to the meeting, making requesting two very small changes to the uh, presentation of his name and the addition of him to the list of attendees at the uh, May meeting, which I apparently overlooked. Uh, I have noted those changes. And so acceptance of the minutes uh, would be pending those changes. 
as as amended then uh, through Commissioner Morrison's request uh, staff member Backstrom has will do that um, I ask for then a vote on acceptance of the minutes as uh, moved by Commissioner Phillips seconded by Commissioner Denard um, Dr. Bryan yes Mr. Dixon yes Dr. Denard yes Dr. Johnson yes Dr. Lowry you have unless she has joined I'm here yes oh, good 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 I see Apologies. you have the, my my screen name is my daughter's name because of school so <laughs> I'm glad you're with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Morrison. Yes. Mr. Reynolds. Yes. Ms. Phillips. Yes. Ms. Snowden. Yes. Dr. Waters. Yes. And uh, I vote yes as well, David Ruffin. So uh, as, approved, as amended, uh, the minutes from the May 29th meeting have been adopted. Uh, I believe it was Commissioner Snowden that had uh, uh, moved in the last meeting that we proceed appropriately to honor um, a recently retired member of the commission, uh, our dear friend, Millie Barbie. Uh, and Dr. Cherry has presented for you, uh, representative of staff's work, a letter, draft letter uh, to the governor requesting emeritus commissioner status for Millie Barbie. Um, you know, she uh, has served on this commission uh, since 1991. Uh, not much of our past were concurrent, uh, but uh, I know commissioners uh, um, uh, Morrison, Bryan, Snowden, and Johnson in particular have years of service uh, with uh, Millie. And, uh, you know, she, I believe, served as chair of this commission for up to five years, as I recall. I think apt for even today's uh, agenda is that she stated that her proudest achievement was presiding over the unanimous approval of the Historical Commission uh, to establish commemorative memorials uh, to African Americans. Um, and I think frequently to this day, we'll say, where are we on that project? Um, She's truly a great lady of Western North Carolina, but who has who cherishes the entire state. She's been on numerous commissions, uh, including, of course, the Historical Commission, and has had, of course, numerous awards. The ultimate, perhaps, the uh, being awarded the Order of the Longleaf Pine. Um, while you have a letter before you today um, to to certainly commemorate. Uh, Millie's service to our commission. Uh, I'd like you to look at it for potential modifications or edits, but also with the possibility that we could turn this into a resolution. Obviously, it's, it is addressed to the governor, only he would have the ability to uh, grant this status of emeritus commissioner. Uh, but uh, certainly wanted to do in the spirit of the uh, uh, motion by Commissioner Snowden at last meeting to present this draft letter to you. Uh, Any... Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanted to point out uh, there's a typo in there on page two about uh, list the Blue Ride Parkway instead of the Blue Ridge Parkway. Ridge. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a Millie ride. might find a little humor it's a ride, in that. But it's not necessarily <laughs> blue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Morris. Sure. Any further discussion? Do I hear any motions relative to the status of the letter or perhaps converting it to a resolution? Harry Morrison will uh, vote to approve the letter to the governor and also uh, to convert that into a resolution. It's not something we can do at the moment, but perhaps at the next meeting, vote on uh, a resolution appropriately worded. I thought it was a very, very good letter. Well, I'll second. I'll defer to um, Barbara. No, I'm gonna to refer to you, so <laughs> you second it. 
Dr. Johnson, uh, again, remember that as we speak, we need to identify ourselves uh, as under the requirements of a, a virtual meeting, as, as tedious as it may be. Dr. Thank Johnson. Thank you for the reminder, Val Dr. Johnson seconds the motion. Okay, as I understand it, uh, Commissioner Snowden uh, moves, uh, seconded by Commissioner Johnson for an amended uh, letter to be sent to the governor and with full consideration at a subsequent uh, meeting uh, turning resolution of the full commission. Mr. So, Ruffin, uh, Perry made that motion. I didn't. Oh, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. It was your original motion from the last meeting. Please excuse me. Commissioner Morrison's uh, motion seconded by Commissioner Johnson. All in favor. Mr. Uh, Chair. Yes, Dr. Uh, Bernard. We, uh, 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 is that room for uh, uh, just a, uh, a minor discussion? I, I wanted to uh, uh, ask a question about uh, uh, the emeritus uh, status. Uh, for those of you who have a longer perspective than I have in serving on this committee, is that something that we uh, grant regularly or uh, uh, how does that operate? Um, this is Kevin Cherry, Deputy Secretary for Archives and History. Um, it is requested by the commission rarely. The governor, it is an honor given by the governor. Um, the individuals who have more recently received emeritus status on the commission uh, were H, uh, Dr. H.G. Jones and Mr. William S. Powell. Um, uh, I, I don't believe if we have any living emeritus uh, members left. Um, Jerry Cashin received emeritus status right before passing away. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. This is Barbara Snowden. The emeritus status, the one thing I remember is having somebody on this committee who has a longer institutional memory than I do help sometime, time, time. don't get a vote. They're an advisor to the commission. Further comments or discussion before we uh, vote on uh, Commissioner Morrison's motion? Not having heard any out, let's proceed to a vote. Uh, Dr. Bryan? Yes. Mr. Dixon? Yes. Dr. Denard? Yes. Dr. Johnson? Yes. Dr. Lowry? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Mr. Reynolds? Yes. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Snowden? Yes. Dr. Waters? Yes. And David Ruffin? Yes. It passes unanimously. The next item on the agenda is um, is relative to an issue that we have dealt with a little bit iteratively, and that is, of course, the State Textile Museum Feasibility Study. Uh, and I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Cherry, who, again, for the record, is uh, not only Deputy Secretary, as he's identified at the Department, uh, North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, also Director of the 
Archives and, uh, uh, and History, Secretary to our North Carolina Historical Commission, State Historic Preservation Officer, and Keeper of the Capitol. And he deserves every one of those titular accolades. So um, I say this at every meeting, but uh, you know he's the glue that holds us together. So thank you very much. And if you could walk us a bit through some of the, I know we at the last meeting we didn't have, we weren't in possession of the final draft and there were a few couple of adjustments or additions rather points of emphasis that I think you would can help us uh, understand. Certainly. Um, provided to the commissioners before the meeting is a listing of the changes made to the penultimate um, draft that you received at the last meeting, but you did not receive the final draft of the feasibility report for the creation of a, of a state textile museum. Um, we actually completed the work in time for the meeting, but we did not complete the work in time for the public posting. So we provided you with the penultimate draft stating that the formal acceptance or whatever the commission wishes to do with the report um, would have to take place at the next meeting. And that's what we're doing now. So between the final, the next to the last report and the final report that you have been provided for this meeting, there are only a few changes. The major substantive changes are two to this report between it and the last report. The first is an emphasis on uh, the report stating that we should begin collecting materials related to textile history and culture now as soon as possible. And it gives greater emphasis to that than the next to the last report. And the other emphasis that was increased in, uh, on, in the final report as opposed to the next to the last report was a, a more in-depth look at labor history related to textiles in North Carolina. Several of our advisors, academic advisors, felt that we should uh, put more emphasis on that. And we have, we've added a whole section on that to the background where we talk about the importance of the, um, of the textile industry to the state of North Carolina. We added that. Now, a quick look at some of the other things that we changed. Um, we added the Kessel History Center at Luray Mill to the list of, of textile museums in the state that the, that the report mentions. We did some minor uh, grammatical changes to clarify the language. We, um, we added more emphasis on saying that this is phased work as opposed to saying we're going to do it all at one time. We had that in the, the next to the last draft, but we put more emphasis on the phasing in of the project. We added the Wilson College of Textiles as a potential part to the potential partners list. We, um, I've already mentioned about the management uh, uh, between la labor and management relations. Um, we added clarification about the roles of local museums and their impact to the town of Irwin's uh, discussion. Um, we did say that the depot in Irwin is not on the National Register and we said it was because of the site. The Historic Preservation Office wanted us to clarify that, and it's because it has been relocated away from the tracks, not because of its current site. So that's why it's no longer on the National Register. We did mention new connections to the trail system near Irwin, and we added a list, a bakery to the list of local amenities to Irwin at the request of the town of Irwin's manager. Um, we changed with Historic Preservation Office suggestion the word stabilization, the rehabilitation of the building because we were have what we were describing is more than stabilizing, it's more along the lines of rehabilitating. So we did that. Um, we added a paragraph on digital strategy, knowing uh, how much museums now depend upon social media, that sort of thing. So we just noted that that would have to be done. Um, we added the role of the Randolph Heritage Association through the different phases. That came about when we were clarifying the phased work. Um, we added where collecting now before it's gone 
to the phased work that we rewrote. Um, we added the fact that Herman Husband owned land nearby. We felt that added to the historical importance of the property. Herman Husband was the Quaker who started the regulator movement in North Carolina, so very early on. Um, and to our list of goals, we added that collecting now uh, focus to our current goals. Those are the changes between the final draft and the draft that was formally presented to you at the last meeting. We are, the department staff is asking that the commission formally accept as is or accept with changes. Uh, the report was already transmitted by the department, but the commission can wish to send a letter of endorsement or not uh, to the legislature for the report. So accept either as is or with changes and then decide whether you want to create a letter of support or not to go to the legislature for the, the feasibility study. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I have completed that unless you, anyone has any questions. Kevin, it's Barbara Snowden. Um, the changes on the list of changes, number 22 and 33 were the same. Uh, it's talking about the picnic tables. In the report, I could find it on page 21. I could not find it use, being used a second time. I may have overlooked it, but uh, I didn't know if that was redundant or if we need to check that. Well, I think that's just a mistake on this piece of paper we're sending to you. Okay. Um, that came about from uh, knowing that we need to use picnic facilities and those types of facilities to make it useful for the museum and the Historic Preservation Office agreed with that, but they wanted to make sure that picnic facilities and things like that would not detract from the historic nature of the bill. Dr. That's Cherry, fine. this is David Ruffin. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. No, I just said, that's fine. I just could not find it the second time and I was questioning my reading ability. Dr. Cherry, we do, we do understand the charge for the commission is to either accept as is or add a, an endorsement letter uh, or recast it as an endorsement letter. Uh, but the other issue is, do we do we just accept that these changes will be part of the revised letter? Yes, okay. these changes, right, because the report that we sent over had these changes already in it. Correct. Yes. Okay, so we let, let's let's catch this in terms of what we really need to determine. Uh, obviously, we need to approve formally approve the state textile museum feasibility study in its final form, uh, as uh, Dr. Cherry has discussed additions and, and, and amendments to, uh, but also the issue of the endorsement beyond just submitting the revised uh, or a cover letter, I guess it would be a cover letter just acknowledging this is the, uh, I, the commission has voted on this and, and accepts it as is. I think that's the better distinction, either as is or with a secondary endorsement. And that's so at, at that, with that boundary, if you will, of discussion, could we, uh, let's open it up for, um, for any comments or thoughts commission members may have. Mr. Chairman, this is Perry Morrison. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the report in final form and also send a letter of endorsement along with that report. This is Mary Lynn Bryan. I second that. Commissioner, uh, this is David Ruffin. Commissioner Morrison uh, has moved and Commissioner Bryan has seconded uh, a motion that we both submit a letter uh, acknowledging uh, uh, acceptance of the final draft as amended, but also include inclusive of with an endorsement. Any discussion? Having heard none, we will proceed to a vote. Um, Dr. Bryan. Yes. Mr. Dixon. 
Mr. Dixon. He's muted. Dixon, uh, we'll come back. We'll pass. I know you. Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm back on. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Dr. Lowry. Yes. Mr. Morrison. Yes. Mr. Reynolds. Yes. Ms. Phillips. Yes. Ms. Snowden. Yes. Dr. Waters. Yes. David Ruffin. Yes. So Did the, I hear my name called? Denard? Yes, Dr. Denard. I, I, I thought I called you. Sorry, Dr. Denard. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. But yes. Yeah. I may not. I was waiting for Mr. Dixon. I may, may have skipped over you. Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, with that having been approved, then the next uh, item on the agenda is uh, sessions and DIA sessions um, to various uh, venues within the state. And for that, I'm asking again, Dr. Uh, Cherry, to guide us through the separate uh, recommendations of staff for uh, sessions and DIA sessions. So what I, this is Kevin Cherry, Deputy Secretary of Archives and History. What I am presenting is the proposed slate of accessions and deaccessions that have been approved by the Office of Archives and History's uh, Collections Committee, and I chair that committee, and we have uh, division directors and collections uh, caretakers and curators who sit on that committee. So we will begin with proposed accessions. And what I would like to do, Mr. Chairman, is to present all of the accessions for all of our institutions at one time so we will not spend so many time, pass through the roll call vote so many times. So I will go through all of the accessions now. You have received this list of accessions and deaccessions uh, previously. So I will, this will be a very uh, quick summarization of what is being um, added to the state collection. Um, at the North Carolina Museum of History, we have a teapot and cup that follows a, a COVID-19 design created by a North Carolina artist. We have a tobacco twine rug from the 40s. We have um, clasps and cuff links and a presidential medallion Gave, given to Dr. Robert Brown of High Point by um, the president of Nigeria. We have um, other materials uh, given to Dr. Uh, Brown during his time working with the Nixon administration. We have um, a Confederate treasury note uh, for the North Carolina Railroad that Dr. Brown received and he's passing on to the, his, to the History Museum. We have um, Confederate notes that Dr. Brown uh, owned that will be going on to the Museum of History. We have homemade uh, cloth mask from COVID-19 uh, that's being added to the Museum of History because we are collecting materials related to the pandemic now while they're available. We also have a bottle of hand sanitizer made by the South Mountain Distillery that usually makes liquor and moonshine, but they're making hand sanitizer for the pandemic. Uh, and that was being added to um, the Mountain Gateway Museum. We have a face shield and reusable cloth mask that uh, was made by the Kitzbow in Old Fort, North Carolina. They usually make bicycle apparel, but they have switched over making uh, protective clothing for the pandemic. So that has been added, or that will be added. Um, and we have a hooded cradle that has a um, Western North Carolina provenance, and we'll be adding that to the Mountain Gateway Museum. At the, Mount, at the Museum of the Albemarle, um, we have a glass bottle from the 1890s that was made locally. We have uh, fr being added to the English collection, a wooden crate slat that reads Wright Brothers, Elizabeth City, North Carolina. So it was taken from a box where materials were being shipped to them 
while they were at the Outer Banks. Um, and then going on to the Maritime Museum system, we have various models of United States Coast Guard aircraft uh, that will be being added to the Maritime Museum system. We have uh, a blueprint of ships designed by George Scarborough, uh, who was from Elizabeth City. We have various postcards and uh, photographs and posters um, that show hurricane damage to New Bern, Southport, and uh, Moorhead City. No, I'm sorry, from Beaufort. We have collections already of those others. This will be from Beaufort. We have a painting of the USS North Carolina being given by Ann King. Um, we have promotional materials uh, related uh, to the Barber Boat Company. And we have a line throwing gun that was used on ships patrolling the coast during World War II. That's from our, our museums, now from historic sites. Um, we have correspondence between Griffith Davis and Dr. Charlotte Hawkins Brown, which discusses the logistics of photo shoots and approval for text for an article on uh, her school. And the article would be appearing in Ebony Magazine. We have a scrapbook from Palmer Memorial Institute from circa 1940, and we'll be adding that to the collection at Historic Edenton. And I'm, I'm going to ask uh, our director of state historic sites to help me here. We have approximately 700 artifacts associated with the Golden Frank's house. Uh, to, that we will be adding. We, we can provide the commission, if you like, an inventory of those items, but we did not do so. But I will ask uh, Michelle Lanier, who's the director of State Historic Sites, just to discuss some of the items that are coming to us with the Golden Frank's house. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Terry. Um, greetings, commissioners and all watching at home. Uh, the Golden Frank's collection um, is comprised of items ranging from household items, ephemera um, from decades, really honestly, 1930s into the late 80s, um, as well as uh, really significant historical um, photographs. Um, there are awards. Uh, the, the item that has appraised the highest in this collection certainly um, that is, is really a treasure is a, a book um, that's by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and it is signed uh, to Dr. Goldie um, Wells, who is the only child of Golden Franks. So the 700 plus number that you have is how many items had been um, really sorted and processed at the time. Um, we are now over 900 items. Um, and so we will continue to go forward. Um, also in the attic was found a, an impressive collection of ladies' hats. Um, there's also holes in the wall where there was a payphone because uh, movement people from all over the country, people like Diane Nash and the Reverend James um, Orange, um, and of course the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. came to the Freedom House in Edenton and there was so much activity um, that Mrs. Frank said, we need a payphone. And so they did install a payphone. We do have the holes uh, and, and intend to uh, acquire a payphone. But we have so many items that are also just um, dishes and furniture, furniture that was at there at the time that um, Dr. King did visit the house. So uh, this is Kevin Cherry again. Thank you, Michelle. As some of you know, we will be interpreting part of Freedom House, Golden Frank's house, in a more traditional um, historic house museum style, but also part of the space we will use as interpretive space, exhibit space, to talk about the civil rights movement in, in Northeastern North Carolina within the context of civil rights movement across the whole state of North Carolina. So these materials are very important to both the exhibit component of this house 
as well as the historic house uh, portion of, of this house. It is um, our most closely related site, or when we get it set up, it will be our, our historic site most closely related to the civil rights movement. We, we have civil rights activity associated with a number of our sites, but the Freedom House will be most closely aligned with the civil rights movement. Um, now we're, we'll move into items collected on the grounds of or near the grounds of the state capitol, and these will be added to a collection that's called the George Floyd Protest Collection, where we are documenting the recent um, protests that have been happening uh, here in North Carolina as a part of uh, greater protests across the, the nation. So we have here uh, an item that uh, is a, an octagonal shape a sign that says stop racism. We have various posters that were collected from the state capitol grounds showing um, um, phrases like Black Lives Matter, justice, accountability, um, white silence is violence, uh, I will never understand, but I stand. Um, you can see some of these. Also, we have a protest sign printed in color ink on copy paper that features the image of George Floyd with three tears on each cheek. Um, we have two pins from flashbang grenades that were found on the state capitol grounds. Um, we have more uh, posters. We have photographs found of African Americans who uh, have recently been murdered that were used during the protest at the state capitol. We have signs, uh, more posters with slogans like defund the police and say his name, George Floyd. Um, so more of those materials. Then we have um, three issues of the Interstate Tattler, uh, which was published in New York, and it uh, was a popular African American uh, publication of the 1960s, and that will be going to Charlotte Hawkins Brown to be used in exhibits. We have Piedmont Airlines um, ticket stubs and promotional brochures, all donated by um, Martha Battle Jackson to the North Carolina Transportation Museum. Um, we have a land grant signed by Governor Acock that will be going to the Charles B. Acock uh, birthplace uh, state historic site. We have a Spencer cartridge from a Spencer repeating rifle uh, that will be going to historic Halifax state historic site for um, the Civil War era collection there. Um, and do any division directors want to make any mention of any item that I may have missed on the accessions? Seeing none, Mr. Chairman, that is the proposal for accessions to state collections from the Office of Archives and, and History's Collections Committee. Mr. Chairman? Yeah, yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I would make a suggestion that Dr. Cherry had requested that these uh, all accessions be presented as a single slate, which makes sense under most circumstances, being that uh, uh, Commissioner Snowden has asked to recuse herself of the items from the Al Museum of the Albemarle. A recommendation would be that the items for accessions into the Museum of the Albemarle be held as a separate vote so that the minutes can reflect her abstention and that the uh, the other five, four items be uh, presented as a single slate so that the minutes can so reflect her inclusion in that vote. Thank you very much. This is David Rupp. Thank you very much, Parker, for that distinction. So we will move, I, I hear um, at, uh, the Mr. question, Mr. Chair, motion. Mr. Yes, Chair, Dr. Denar. Uh, I move uh, approval of the proposed sessions, uh, excluding at this point, excluding at this point, the Museum of the Albemarle. 
Dr. Denard has uh, moved approval of the accessions on all for all items, all areas except for the Museum of the Alamo. Do I hear a second? I Harry second. Morrison seconds. Doc, uh, uh, Mr. Morrison, I believe, has seconded. So uh, do, is there any discussion further before we move to a vote? Hearing none, uh, the vote is on accessions <clears throat> to the North Carolina Museum of History, the North Carolina Gateway Museum, the North Carolina Maritime Museums, and various North Carolina historic sites. Dr. Bryan. Yes. Mr. Dixon. Yes. Dr. Denard. Yes. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Dr. Lowry. Yes. Mr. Morrison. Yes. Reynolds. Yes. Phillips. Yes. Mrs. Snowden. Yes. Dr. Waters. Yes. David Ruffin. Yes. Then we need to move to the uh, vote to the accept the proposed accessions to the North Carolina Museum of the Albemarle. Do I hear a motion? Valerie here, I so move that we accept the accessions from Museum of the Albemarle. Moved by Commissioner Johnson. Do I hear a second? Houston Phillips second. Commissioner Phillips, thank you, uh, has seconded the motion to accept the proposed accessions of staff to the North Carolina Museum of the Albemarle. Any discussion before we proceed to a vote? Okay, Dr. Bryan. Yes. Mr. Dixon. Yes. Dr. Denard. Yes. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Dr. Lowry. Yes. Mr. Morrison. Yes. Mr. Reynolds. Yes. Phillips. Yes. Snowden. Cruz. Dr. Waters. Yes. And David Ruffin. Yes. So approved. Well, I have a question. What, what we were just voting, was that the Museum of the Albemarle? Correct. And Commissioner Snowden had recused herself from that. So she wasn't. I beg your pardon. That was a technical, that was an error of the chair. Uh, please, please have the record acknowledge that uh, Ms. Snowden's vote was requested by the chair, but in error. Yes. And you'll be glad to know that I go off the board the end of this month, so we won't have to do it anymore. Albemarle board, not this board. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, All right, Mr. Chairman, we now move to DX sessions, and as the members of the commission know, we pay a little bit more close attention to de accessions than we do accessions. And for de accessions, we have two votes. One is to de accession the items, and two is to approve of the method of the de accession. So I will go through and explain uh, why we may want to, to de accession the item, and then what our plans are for how they are de accessioned. So from the Maritime Museum in Beaufort, we propose to deaccession a modern uh, tool chest. We have no idea how this got into our collection in the first place. We would like to transfer it to actually be used in, our, in the museum's boat center as an actual tool chest by our volunteers who work on the various boats. We would like to deaccession the oyster shucking stand for that circa 1935 because we have four of them and three, the three others are in better shape than, than, than this one that we will be um, deaccessioning if you allow it. And we propose to offer this oyster shucking stand to a regional museum in the area. So a county based museum or a private nonprofit museum in the area. Um, we have another toolbox from 1950, um, and it's newer, it's plywood, and we have two older, better examples of toolbox from the same creator, and we propose to sell this toolbox at auction. 
Um, we have a modern tool chest that was donated to us by a, a, carpent, a local carpenter. It's in fairly good condition, but again, we have better examples of this that are older. So we will sell that one by auction if the commission approves. Um, we have four sets of trawl doors. They are, they were probably used as an exhibit prop at some point. They're in very poor condition. They're cracked and we, they really don't have much value and we have some older ones. Uh, so we just propose to discard these. We have some double blocks from the Linen Bank Architectural Company. They are good. Uh, but we already have some that represent the company. We have 12 of these in the collection and one, another set that from this actual company. So we propose to sell this one at auction. We have a flax spinning wheel. Uh, and this one is good, but it's missing parts. And we already have one complete flax wheel that we are keeping. We have a, a miniature spinning wheel, and we have three spinning wheels already. Uh, so we will be selling this one at auction. And we have a yarn winder, and um, the donor of that yarn winder actually gave us a better example. So we will now be auctioning that yarn winder off. Um, we also have a mall. The donor gave us three malls, and we really only need one mall, so we will be auctioning the other two off, and you see them here. So that's the plan. Uh, those are the items to be deaccessioned this time, and the method of deaccession. David Ruffin. I was going to say, I move approval of the deaccession list. Uh, Say Dixon, I'll second. Commissioner uh, Bryan has moved for the uh, acceptance or agreement with the deaccessions. Uh, Commissioner Dixon has <coughs> seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll proceed to a vote. Uh, Dr. Br uh, Dr. Bryan? Yes. Mr. Dixon? Yes. Dr. Denard? Yes. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Dr. Lowry. Ms. Dr. Lowry. Yes. Dr. Lowry. We'll move on. Uh, Mr. Morrison. Yes. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Dr. Lowry votes yes. Mr. Morrison. Yes. Reynolds. Yes. Ms. Phillips. Yes. Ms. Snowden. Yes. Dr. Waters. Yes. David Ruffin. Yes. Now we need to, uh, under the rules of DIA sessions, we need to also uh, vote to approve the manner or means by which the DIA sessions were proposed by staff. Do I hear any motions in that manner? This is Terry Morrison. I will uh, make a motion to approve the method of the accession and disposition. This is Barbara Snowden. I second. Moved by Commissioner Morrison and seconded by uh, Commissioner Snowden on the uh, means uh, of the accession. Any, di any discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, uh, we'll call the roll. Uh, Dr. Bryan. Yes. Uh, Mr. Dixon. Yes. Dr. Denard. Yes. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Dr. Lowry. Yes. Mr. Morrison. Yes. Mr. Reynolds. Yes. Phillips. Yes. Ms. Snowden. Yes. Dr. Waters. Yes. David Ruffin. Yes. I believe that concludes the accessions and deaccessions. Um, I'd like to take a point of, of a personal comment, not as your chair, but personally on um, this next agenda item. Um, it gives me a, some sense of disappointment uh, 
and perhaps to others on the commission, not disappointment that the three monuments have been removed because from my personal opinion, they seem to have been removed under the bounds of law. Um, but that the disappointment is that all the work this commission did and the uh, study committee appointed by it in 2018 for a variety of reasons and from a variety of uh, perspectives, uh, we were not able to get our recommendations enacted. And uh, in that sense, that's, that's where I go. But having said that, I think it's, uh, we're charged again with revisiting the ultimate disposition of these three monuments. Uh, irrespective of our personal opinions or our desire, as they say in the biblical sense, let this cut pass from us, um, it is the North Carolina Historical's duty, a uh, commission's duty, uh, to deal with this once again. I think by statutes, that's our responsibility to do. Uh, and yes, again. So having said that, I would like to describe in, in brief uh, a little bit of a summary of the petition from the Department of Administration. You've all been provided with that, the cover letter uh, from Ms. Sanders, the, uh, Secretary to, to the Department of Administration. Uh, the petition itself, uh, details the, the various parties uh, from, from their uh, appropriate legal statuses and standing in the petition. And of course, the properties again need to be identified. The, it is the 19, excuse me, the 1895 Confederate Monument, the Henry Lawson Wyatt Memorial, and the North Carolina Women of the Confederacy Monument. Uh, these are the three uh, monuments that, that we are being requested to determine the ultimate disposition of. I will read verbatim the requested relief of the petition from the Office of or Department of Administration. The petitioner respectfully requests direction by the commission as to the future of these monuments. The petitioner prays that the commission pursuant to its statutory powers and duties undertake an appropriate review of the circumstances presented and determine whether each monument should be accessioned as an artifact of the Office of Archives and History and made available for exhibit or study. Alternatively, the petitioner respectfully requests determination by the commission whether each monument should permanently be placed on property belonging to the state, and if so, the specific location for the placement of each monument. Now, in, in summary, that is the petition. Uh, again, you, you've had your, your copies of that. I also think it is of note that um, in this regard, uh, as, as our general counsel, Phil Fagan, has recused himself on mm -hmm. matters to this issue, we're joined today, of course, by Karen Blum, who's Deputy North Carolina Attorney General who in matters of this nature uh, are, is acting as, as legal counsel to the commission. Um, of course, my sense is that a studied response to this petition uh, will require more research and deliberation than is possible on today's agenda. It's certainly open for discussion. Mr. Chairman, um, I move that the North Carolina Historical Commission through you as chair appoint a study group or committee from our membership to work with the with appropriate staff members of the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources under the leadership of Dr. Cherry to effect a timely response to the North Carolina Department of Administration's petition related to the ultimate relocation of the three Union Square Confederate monuments. I put that in the form of a motion. This is Perry Morris, and I'll second that motion. Motion has been made to appoint a committee or subcommittee of the full commission uh, by Commissioner Dixon, seconded by Commissioner Morrison. Do we hear any discussion? Mr. Chair, uh, David Denard. I'm not opposed to uh, uh, the creation of another uh, subcommittee to study this uh, item uh, 
and provide some relief as requested. Uh, but I would uh, caution us against uh, any uh, uh, retracted work uh, comparable to uh, what transpired uh, with the last day. Uh, uh, we actually compared uh, 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 the tone uh, for that last uh, uh, piece of research. And then, as the chairs noted, it almost amounted to nothing. You know, because we're back to uh, 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 a square one. Uh, so uh, uh, I think with all of the research, you know, that's been done, uh, uh, we could uh, uh, put together uh, something at this point uh, uh, that's a little more concise uh, and not as protracted uh, as the last uh, uh, item uh, that came back to this committee uh, from the uh, 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 subcommittee uh, that was created. Commissioner Denard uh, could not agree with you more. They are very pertinent comments, and I think there are different, uh, they're quite different distinctions uh, on the charge. I think, in fairness, before we ask for a vote, I would like to propose the subcommittee that I would propose uh, to be formed, and they would be uh, Dr. Valerie Johnson. Uh, Mr. Sam Dixon, Dr. Johnson, of course, from Oxford, Mr. Dixon from Edenton, Ms. Barbara Snowden from Currituck, Dr. Darren Waters from Asheville, and I will again serve uh, as chair of that subcommittee or study group. But I think your point is extremely well made. Uh, much of our deliberation will be done with quite different focuses. Uh, I think one of the other key differences is that in the in the previous uh, work we did in 2018, we were heavily focused on, frankly, the legal uh, ability to, to remove the statutes under the current law and so forth. I think now we are committed and in, in as part of Commissioner Dixon's uh, resolution, it's embedded in there, working very, very closely with staff to inform us of where the final disposition of these. It's not any longer a matter of removal uh, of, from the Union Square. It's a matter of where is the most appropriate position of uh, or, uh, ultimately where they need to go. So that's that I think is, but your point I think is quite uh, well made and I think it's quite uh, timely. Any other discussion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I just wanted to, uh, we can either talk about this before we vote or after we vote, but uh, in reviewing the petition, they only seemed to want the commission to look at two different options. Um, for instance, uh, for the each monument could be should be accessioned as an artifact by the Office of Archives and History, and I, I would like for the subcommittee that is looking at this to also think of possible other options. Uh, just as an example, and that this is just coming right off the top of my head, the, the North Carolina Women of the Confederacy Monument could be considered a work of art and might go to another department or another place or a, a university somewhere. And, you know, I, I would like the subcommittee to sort of be open-minded about what their recommendations are. Commissioner, this is David Ruffin. Commissioner Morrison, again, I agree wholeheartedly. We, I think that if you look at each one of the monuments, they have different uh, aspects to them, different uh, points of interest, different, uh, speak to different aspects, uh, issues. And I think that that's very, very appropriate. I certainly would not consider us to be frankly limited by any uh, binary uh, aspect of the petition. I think the petition guides us to make some uh, general directional decisions, but I certainly don't, would not necessarily limit our discussions and deliberations relative to that. Um, Dr. Johnson here. So as we do engage in these deliberations, 
will this be um, in the form of a recommendation? And will this be something that will be definitive and final so that whatever happens to the monuments, that will be it and that we would not have to revisit this periodically every couple of years as be, or are we, I mean, can we make it that strong a statement that this is, that we're recommending that this be um, kind of a final disposition of these things or do we still leave it kind of open? That's just what I wanna hear from others if that's a possibility. This is Susan Phillips. I think, Dr. Johnson, that that um, we the commission doesn't have the power. That's that power lies with the legislature, I believe. Um, and if they choose to make another uh, law that deals with the monuments, then that's within their purview. Mr. Madry might have something else to say about that. Or he might not be here. I think I was, this is Dr. Johnson again, I think I was thinking more of the position for the committee to consider and to take, to be able to take, uh, whether or not, since, whether or not that actual is actualized is a different story. But um, I just feel that a part of our discussion should be around um, how this should play out um, in the ways in which we do our business. If you kind of get my drift, I, I would like for that to be part of the discussion. Mr. Chairman, this is Perry Uh May I just express my understanding to Dr. Johnson's point that I am moving uh, or I seconded the motion with the assumption that the subcommittee would make recommendations to the North Carolina Historical Commission and that we would discuss and vote. It, this is David Ruffin. There's no question whatsoever. We would not in any way think that the subgroup or the subcommittee would have uh, full say. It would be as is 2018 then presented to the full commission for approval. Uh, I, Mr. Madry has joined and I certainly ask him if he would have any comments um, about uh, Commissioner Phillips concerns or statements. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, I'm John Madry, general counsel for the Department of Administration. Uh, I, I believe by my reading of the, the existing statute uh, that are on the, the books that the Historical Commission has the authority to determine whether uh, monuments be placed on, on state property or otherwise uh, uh, placed in, into uh, a position for, for accession and, and display or study. Uh, beyond that, um, I, I don't know of any way that uh, there could be anything more final or definitive than what the Commission ultimately de determines. Obviously, uh, future legislation could change that, but that that's my read of the existing statutory uh, powers and, and responsibilities, the duties of the historical commission. This is uh, David Ruffin. Uh, I, I agree with that interpretation because uh, that's obviously why we're the epicenter of this discussion again. Uh, it seems to be the law states it in currently. Remember, technically, even though it was controversial, technically we voted in 2018 to have their monuments stand with significant conceptualization and significant rebalancing of the uh, landscape of the of Union Square relative to representation of African-Americans and civil rights didn't happen. But my point there is I, I certainly understand at this point, this would not be an academic exercise of just an opinion. Um, it should because as I read, and, and I'm not an attorney, I've got three or four on this uh, panel today that are, and certainly I would defer to them on that, but I certainly do think that that's, as we sit today, that's why we're frankly being asked to deliberate on this again.
But I will, I will concur with what I think is an underlying issue and probably some of all of you, but we would need to expedite and, and deal with this. <clears throat> I couldn't agree with Commissioner Johnson more with some degree of finality. Any other discussion? One other, uh, uh, David, uh, David and Art here. Uh, one other issue that I think uh, uh, needs to be considered when we think about uh, uh, whether each monument should be a session as an artifact by the Office of Archives and History and made available for exhibit or study. And the second uh, item, the petitioner respectfully requests the determination by the commission whether each monument should be permanently uh, should permanently be placed on property belonging to the state, and if so, the specific location. Uh, now we uh, talked about uh, the location last time uh, with regard to uh, the Battle of Bentonville. And uh, one of the issues that uh, came up is that uh, uh, we could not uh, really, uh, based on the, the law that exists, uh, we could not place these items uh, at some other location that was not of similar prominence uh, to the place from which they were moved, or re uh, you know, uprooted. Uh, uh, so uh, here again, Unless we deal with the, the issue uh, of safety, uh, and that's what I've seen uh, in the removal of some of these monuments in uh, other locations, they said that, well, uh, the whole issue of safety and, uh, uh, and what that would entail uh, kind of required looking at the relocation of these uh, monuments differently uh, then we looked at them when this item came before us. Uh, so the uh, 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 the issue of safety, uh, wherever we put them, wherever we uh, uh, think about them being exhibited, uh, has to be given some uh, serious thought. Uh, uh, and if this issue of safety, for example, may override uh, some of the uh, other uh, issues related to uh, uh, a similar place of promise. Uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's all I, I, I would like to add. For example, this is my last point. Uh, uh, here in uh, Pitt County, uh, uh, we removed a uh, monument from the uh, uh, grounds of the Pitt County Courthouse. And uh, the underwriting uh, factor related to the removal was for safety purposes, safety purposes, and not so much uh, thinking about uh, moving it from one place of prominence to another place of similar prominence. You know? uh, uh, and then a relocation committee uh, was set up uh, here uh, to, uh, to deal with uh, uh, what should ultimately happen uh, to that monument after it was taken down. And the final, uh, uh, the recommendation from that relocation committee was that uh, since the item had been gifted uh, to the uh, uh, the county, the county then uh, had a right to uh, to re-gift it or give it to uh, give it back to uh, 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 a group, a non-profit uh, group uh, that may have been willing to accept it. Uh, so that was the resolution, but all of the matter related to uh, uh, safety and the uh, uh, the county uh, uh, manager, uh, along with the county commissioners, uh, viewed that if the monument remained at the place of where it existed, uh, it would continue to create uh, uh, issues of safety that would involve the uh, uh, the sheriff's department, the police department, and all of that. Uh, so the basic rationale for removing it and then disposing of it was uh, related to the issue of safety. Uh, 
And that's uh, that's uh, that's the point I'm saying. I think that we would need to take a close look at at this point. Uh, and, and 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 that concludes my uh, observations of Mr. Chair and other commissioners. Chairman Chairman Ruffin, could I add a comment to that? This is Melinda Lowry. Um, yes. I appreciate the um, careful consideration of our ability to act within the law and echo Dr. Denard in saying that recent events in particular have mandated to me the, the principle that the commission's recommendations take very local county level concerns into account as it's defining safety and it's defining prominent location and other elements that are within the legal purview that we have. Um, I think Pitt County is a wonderful example. There's of course, um, recently I believe Johnston County, Chatham and others have had to confront these issues locally without a lot of guidance from the state. Um, and so as a historical commission, we might be able to play a very constructive and important role if um, our subcommittees work is uh, very much on the ground and considering perhaps that all definitions of safety or that all types of sites are not equivalent. I just wanted to add that, thank you. Thank you very, very much, very well said. Um, any further discussion? I might add that uh, Commissioner Snowden had uh, shared with me her the need to leave the meeting early today so she may not still be with us but uh, uh, other other points of, oh i'm sorry uh commissioner snowden please excuse me i'll be, I'll be here till three okay thank you any other questions or discussion points this is david ruffin With that, um, hearing uh, any additional uh, questions or discussions, let's move on the motion uh, made by Commissioner Dixon, seconded by Commissioner Morrison, uh, to form a subgroup or study committee of this full commission to report back to the full commission on, this, on a timely response and, and in a deep coordination with the staff, pertinent staff, uh, to the uh, request embedded in the petition from the Depart State Department of Administration. Dr. Bryan. Yes. Mr. Dixon. Yes. Dr. Denard. Yes. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Dr. Lowry. Yes. Doctor, excuse me, Mr. Morrison. Yes. Ms. No, Mr. Reynolds, excuse me. Yes. Ms. Phillips. Yes. Ms. Snowden. Yes. Dr. Waters. Yes. David Ruffin, yes. So approved. Um, let's see, next on the agenda is the reports of the various uh, directors of the departments. And again, I will ask uh, that Dr. Cherry uh, coordinate the introduction of those reports, if at all possible. Thank you so much. All right. And I ask the division directors, you do not have to go over all of the material that you provided in your written report. You just need to summarize. So we will begin with Ms. Angela Thorpe who's making a report from the African-American Heritage Commission. Greetings, commissioners. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging Dr. Valerie Ann Johnson, chair of the North Carolina African-American Heritage Commission, as well as Michelle Lanier, uh, founding executive director of the commission. As Dr. Cherry stated, I will be going through just a summary um, of the points that I provided in the written report. 
To start, I'll begin with a commissioner and staff update. So as you all very well may know, Dr. Valerie Ann Johnson is now serving in the role of Dean of the School of Arts, Sciences, and Humanities at Shaw University. And so we are very, very proud of her uh, for that transition and for the work that she is leading at Shaw University, of course, one uh, of our state uh, institutional gyms and historically black colleges. Dr. Johnson is also co-editing a publication by Springer Press centered on discovering hidden histories of the slave trade through maritime vessels and their material culture. I should also offer up that Hannah Francis, uh, a PhD candidate and former research fellow for the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission will have an article in this publication. So again, we're so very proud of the great work that Dr. Johnson is leading. Additionally, Dr. Tamara Holmes Brothers, Vice Chair to the African American Heritage Commission, is now serving as the Deputy Director of the North Carolina Arts Council. So it has been an absolute joy to welcome her to the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources and to strategize around how we can leverage both her role with the Arts Council and uh, the commission to really strengthen our work of uh, building up and leveraging work around African-American art across the state of North Carolina. I'll also mention that Commissioner Dolores Rose has been serving as a steadfast liaison to the Federal Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, of which Michelle Lanier is uh, of the newest appointed commissioners. And so we're grateful for that work and to deepen that relationship with that federal commission. Finally, the commission was pleased, um, actually I should say overjoyed to welcome an associate director this past spring. Adrian Nearday joined us from the President James K. Polk State Historic Site and her work will be critical to continuing to move forward the work um, of building up commission programming and outreach. Additionally, Ms. Nearday will be leading the commission's communication strategy. And so we're very thrilled that just in a few short weeks, we will um, enter into uh, the 21st century with social media and continue to expand our presence uh, through digital communications across the state of North Carolina. Moving on to some commission projects and initiatives. As some of you may know, we have been working uh, to execute the North Carolina Green Book Project since the summer of 2017. And uh, that federal grant award, which was provided by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, officially concluded just a couple of days ago uh, on August 31st, 2020. The public, public components of this project um, have launched over phases since the beginning of 2020. So in March, we launched two identical traveling exhibits centered on Green Book sites, uh, the owners of those sites, and African-American travel during the Jim Crow era in North Carolina. Those exhibits launched concurrently at the Haytai Heritage Center in Durham, North Carolina, as well as the International Civil Rights Center and Museum in Greensboro, North Carolina. As you all can imagine, the traveling exhibit schedule has been disrupted by the realities of COVID-19. However, we are working very closely with host sites and host institutions uh, to do some shifting around that schedule and to prepare for 2021. In the meantime, there is a digital interactive version of that exhibit available. So our constituents are able to connect to that digital tool. In addition, in September, later this month, we will be launching the Green Book web portal. And so folks will be able to connect uh, with the, rea the realities of the Green Book in North Carolina through that web resource in just a few short weeks. 
We're very proud of the work of this project that has occurred over the course of this last three years. And um, I want to give you just a brief snapshot of some of the impacts. Over 500 constituents were engaged around the Green Book Project at various events across the state throughout the three years of the project, including HBCU homecomings, African-American cultural festivals, and grassroots community informational sessions and library and university programs. Additionally, over 50 oral histories were, collect were collected uh, in conjunction with this project and 12 individual families donated archival materials or physical materials to this project. Recently, our state magazine wrote a beautiful piece about this project um, you can actually catch that piece in this September issue of our state magazine. And finally, a project white paper detailing the experience of executing this project will be available later this month. So should you all have interest, I would be more than happy to provide a copy of that white paper to this commission. Just recently, um, this spring actually, the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission received funding from the William G. Pomeroy Foundation to develop and launch the North Carolina Civil Rights Trail in partnership with Visit North Carolina and the North Carolina Office of Archives and History. This project will identify and mark both digitally and physically, North Carolina sites that were key to the U.S. civil rights movement, as well as sites that were critical to moving forward civil rights in our state. Ultimately, this project will yield one interactive digital map of North Carolina civil rights sites and 50 physical community-based markers uh, by January of 2023. Much like the State Historical Highway Marker Program, we are inviting constituents, community groups, municipalities, and historic institutions to apply for these markers. This project publicly launched uh, just a few short days ago, actually in August 2020 to great acclaim, and there's already a lot of excitement. We're getting quite a lot of interest from community groups. And so we expect a number of applications by the December 2020 deadline. The first round of up to 20 markers will be awarded uh, in February of 2021 after uh, an advisory board review of these applications. And I should mention, again, we've received an incredible amount of support from the Office of Archives and History in developing this program, especially from Ansley Wegner. For more details about this project, you can visit the commission website. Uh, and I'm hopeful that you all will engage your local communities and activate people to apply for these markers. I recall that the last time we convened, commissioners had a great deal of interest in the Commission's Africa to Carolina initiative. And as a reminder, this initiative serves to identify, acknowledge, and mark each site in the state where enslaved African Americans disembarked directly from the African continent. I'm pleased and thrilled to be moving forward on this work, particularly through funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We received word of this funding award this summer, and the next phase of this project will officially kick off uh, in September 2020, so of course now. This project will yield uh, a graduate research fellow to perform additional research on the slave trade in the colony of North Carolina. The research fellow will also work to develop one introductory exhibit centering on the relationship between the transatlantic slave trade and North Carolina. The exhibit will consist of a few exhibit panels that will cover details about the Africa to Carolina project, the slave trade in the colony of North Carolina, 
details about what we know and are trying to learn about disembarkation uh, at different North Carolina points of entries and the lives and legacies of enslaved African Americans in North Carolina. Slightly variable versions of this exhibit will be installed at Bath State Historic Site, Brunswick Town Fort Anderson State Historic Site, Edenton State Historic Site, Somerset Place State Historic Site, Tryon Palace, Roanoke Island Festival Park, and the North Carolina Maritime Museum at Beaufort in 2022. And this project will also fund the development of an Africa to Carolina web portal, enabling constituents to connect more deeply, again, to North Carolina's connections to the transatlantic slave trade and additional resources that exist around this trade. And so again, I'm very, very excited that we're able to move forward uh, with this project specifically the research and community engagement piece with funding. Finally, the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission continues to offer statewide technical assistance on a diversity of issues related to African American heritage preservation. And so I'd like to give you just a snapshot of one technical assistance opportunity that we're currently involved in. This centers on the Market House in Fayetteville, North Carolina. As many of you are likely aware, the Market House has received increased attention from a diversity of groups with various interests around this space. And a number of groups, uh, again, are um, encountering uh, histories in this space that um, have not been quite revealed, specifically the space's connection to the trade of African Americans in the space. The North Carolina African American Heritage Commission has been working very closely with a local African American Heritage Commission known as the River Jordan Committee on African American Heritage. Through supporting this committee, we have been able to connect with Fayetteville City Council to answer questions about inclusive, equitable, honest, and compassionate placemaking. We have also connected both the River Jordan Committee and the Fayetteville City Council with the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. We're working with these ent entities to um, pretty much develop a package that will allow the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience to provide insight into placemaking uh, in painful spaces across the world to the Fayetteville City Council, to provide training for community conversations around painful issues and histories to both the City Council and the River Jordan Committee. And finally, to offer up support and planning for next steps of this space. And so again, this is an example of one of the ways in which the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission can use its relationships and its very broad national and international network to support work around painful and fraught histories uh, in North Carolina and local issues in North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. And now I'm calling upon the director of the Division of Archives and Records, State Archivist and Keeper of the Great Seal, Sarah Kuhn. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you to the commissioners and my uh, fellow division directors and guests today. Um, just a little bit of a brief update uh, from the Division of Archives and Records since our last report. Um, I, in, in my written report, I highlighted a number of outreach activities that the staff have undertaken uh, recently, including several that involve uh, programs with various museums and federal historic sites and um, other institutions across North Carolina. But I would like to emphasize uh, one group that's really doing a lot of outreach that can, can be hidden within our division, and that's our records analysis unit in government records. Um, one of our important constituencies are creators of public records all across the state, 
And I have to say that my analysts have really embraced um, the ability to transform their work in telework, and they simply cannot keep uh, the calendar you know, rolling fast enough for training for state and local officials. As soon as they post new workshops, they're full. And so that's been, been very gratifying that they have been able to actually do extra work in the time of, of the pandemic to do more outreach to more people that are creating public records and advising them on scheduling and proper management. And we've been doing a lot of outreach also around what kind of records they may be creating about COVID-19 and that response on the state and local level and, and how they should be retaining those. So that, that's a particular um, outreach programming highlight that I wanted to mention. We've also been doing um, a lot of social media creation and online content creation to try to meet the needs of people who can't come into the search room yet. And uh, in that vein, I would draw your attention to the fact that we have created two behind the scenes tour videos. Prior to the pandemic, I did uh, tours every single month, uh, mostly for adult groups, but sometimes for school groups. So we've created a, a version of that on YouTube. And for the kids, what we're doing is we're offering that video and then an opportunity to schedule with us this fall and ask an archivist um, follow up so that school kids can, can chat with us about what we do and what they might've seen on the behind the scenes um, video. So that, that was a lot of fun to create. Um, I also know that we have several lawyers, several historians and history buffs on the commission. So if any of you are interested in trying your hand at our online crowdsource transcription, site transcribe and see, I would welcome your um, input, particularly the lawyers. Uh, we've just added a new collection of colonial court records and those are in need of transcription. <laughs> Did you have a question or do you want to sign up? Um, I do have a, I'm interested, but is this like run like the Smithsonian program where volunteers are asked? Correct. To, yeah. And, right. Yeah, I am in. Yeah. Okay, I can certainly get you some information. We have a variety of collections up there, everything from typewritten to these colonial court records. Um, and so there it says for a variety of, of interest levels and, and people can pick a collection that's of most interest to them. But um, the colonial court records is part of a, a grant from the NHPRC and the National Archives. And that grant includes a, a processing of the collection, finding aids that have not been done. So much more robust online access and then a crowdsource transcription. So this is this is a fun project we've got going on with really some of our very earliest records um, from the colony. Um, one uh, I, I listed in my report also several projects that we that we have uh, ongoing. Some that are new during the time of telework, and some that are ongoing and continuing. Um, but the one that I really wanted to mention that's been uh, fairly new uh, involves a collaboration with Angela and Adrian at the African American Heritage Commission. Um, this started out of some conversations I was having with Angela probably a year and a half ago now about how the state archives and the commission could better partner. And that has grown into a project that we are um, growing and giving birth to, uh, I guess is a good analogy. And that project will be involve a survey eventually of anyone, and this can be at a university, college, local history collection, archival collection, um, to see who is holding materials about African American history. And then from there, we're hoping after the survey, some of the outcomes from that will be to find out the needs of people who are preserving um, African American history across the state and, and how can we best serve those needs. And we're anticipating that some of those outcomes may include um, resources on preservation, resources on collection, donation, and things like that. So that's been a great collaboration. We've drawn in the State Library and Chaitra Powell, who is on staff at Wilson Library at UNC Chapel Hill to help kind of guide and start this process. Um, so we're looking forward to, fingers crossed, a survey by June of next year. So that's, that's our goal with that project. And then finally, um, I would uh, like to, to mention that uh, in the days following the death of George Floyd, as our staff was, as a lot of areas of the department and across the country were grappling with this intersection of racial inequity and, and societal changes, um, that has given our staff an opportunity to pause and look more deeply at our um, processes and where are there improvements that we need to make 
to make our collections more diverse and more accessible. And so after a lot of conversations in the management team, we have centered around uh, two major activities that we think will fit and hold us accountable to our statement that we issued about equity and access in archival collections, specifically us. And those two activities include a review of our broad descriptive practices around our collections. So that might include bibliographic notes, finding aids, metadata, um, and the language that is used around those materials. Um, there's, a, there's a large push within the archival profession now to undertake this kind of work. So it's exciting that there's a community of practice growing up around this, that, so we're not on our own. In fact, one of the sort of um, leaders in this area locally is in Chapel Hill, where they've already started this process at, at Wilson Library. So we hope to learn from, from their experiences so far. And that's, that's one aspect. So we're trying to take a look at writ large, our descriptive practices and how can we um, make those descriptive, those descriptive materials more inclusive. And then we're also looking at um, prioritizing community building. What, where have we been in terms of connections with various groups across North Carolina? And, and then where should we be going? Who have we not been in touch with? Who could we serve better? And um, looking more, more uh, deeply at that. Both of these items had been percolating within the division. They just had not been prioritized. And so I feel like that has been a good opportunity for us to take some time to pause, review and prioritize those, those activities. So um, I was having a conversation about these activities yesterday with Michelle Lanier. And as, as I, my analogy is we're building the foundation upon which we will construct the house. So we want to do things correctly and with deliberation and with the intent to be committed to progress. So um, I will be happy to keep you informed about those activities, both of, both of those things. But that's, that's where we kind of centered our discussions on that intersection of equity and diversity and our profession. And sadly, since I wrote my report, we have had the third flood in the basement of our building in eight months. So I would just draw everyone's attention to the fact that our facility has some serious problems and it is endangering our collections. And I'm working closely with Kevin to try to see what we can do to rectify those problems. Um, other duties as, as described, not taught to you in graduate school how to run a wet dry back. So, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions or please feel free to email me if you have questions about uh, Transcribe NC um, or any of our other outreach activities. Thank you, Sarah. And now our Director of State History Museums, Ken Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. I am pleased to report that after six months, we're going to be reopening our museums. Uh, the Museum of History in Raleigh, the Museum in, of Albal in the Museum of Albemarle, uh, the Maritime Museums, and uh, the Regional Museums will all open next Thursday, September the 10th. Museum of Cape Fear is going to delay one day to open on the 11th, and the Graveyard of the Atlantic is having some construction done. Uh, so they're going to wait until Monday the 14th of September to open. So we are all anxious to get uh, people back in the building. There obviously is a long list of uh, reopening plans and procedures we're going through that Kevin and the department have approved, uh, meeting all the DHHS recommendations for cleanliness and sanitary conditions and and people wearing masks and all those types of things. So we're, again, very, very anxious to, to be reopening back to the public. Most of the museums are gonna obviously open with only uh, a smaller number of uh, visitors coming in. We're gonna cap the Museum of History at 250 visitors at a single time. And we are offering our early hours for uh, people who are more susceptible to COVID and, and uh, senior citizens will be able to come into the museum from nine to 11 and everybody else will be able to come in after. So we're gonna go back to pretty much our regular hours at the Museum of History. We are gonna be closed on Monday to allow us to uh, do more cleaning and things, but pretty much we're gonna be open from nine to five, Monday through Saturdays and 12 to five on Sundays. So again, we're very much looking forward to, to getting back to work as far as having the visitors back in the museum. We have been fortunate enough to be able to reopen some of our museum shops a few weeks ago. Uh, as you know, most of the support groups that, that run the shops uh, have been 
physically challenged by not having any income. And so we were able to get the shops open early. Uh, they've been able to pick up a little bit of business, but we anticipate obviously more once we all open. As you can see from our report, we've been very active on doing digital programming, uh, a lot more programs on our all of our websites for all of our museums. The Museum of History was very fortunate to get a $400,000 COVID grant from the legislature at the end of July to be used to develop more COVID programming, more online programming for students across the state. The issue is we have to have that money spent by the end of December. So we're working quickly to develop some more uh, videos, online videos, uh, some more online lectures, uh, and again, online materials. We actually are gonna be bringing in some consultants from schools, some, some history teachers, and some department chairs to look at the materials that we already have on our website and make recommendations for the holes that we may be missing. Uh, and also working again with um, DPI on what standards do we need to make sure we're including in our history education. So again, we wanna focus more again on how do we get more materials out into the hands of teachers and students across the state who don't have the materials today to teach North Carolina history. In addition, we're gonna be working on opening new exhibits within the museums. Uh, the Museum of History will be opening a beach music exhibit uh, that will open the week of uh, September the 14th. And uh, so that's, we're, we're excited to finally be able to open a new exhibit. Ironically, some of the exhibits that we had just opened right before we had to close the museum, such as Women's Suffrage and our Supreme Court exhibit, 200th anniversary of the Supreme Court, uh, we'll be able to continue keeping those exhibits open for a much longer period of time since they have been closed. Um, we are making progress again on other things. We did get a grant from the North Carolina Humanities Council to do a 360 degree virtual tour of the story of North Carolina. So we'll be working on that this fall as well. In addition to that, we're making progress on building uh, on the building design for the uh, expansion of the Museum of History. Uh, as I said, as I attached to my report, there are some new uh, drawings we're doing. The architects are moving now to the interior of the building, uh, as well as continuing to revamp the exterior design. But now we're looking on the interior building to see how the floors are going to look, how the new atrium will look, and how we're going to reorganize the current lobby to be all about the story of North Carolina. In addition to that, the uh, North Carolina Civil War and Reconstruction Project is moving along at great pace. Uh, we, you know, Dr. Cherry and I were able to visit down there last week and see the progress that they've been made on the history village that is being created. Uh, three historical buildings have been moved to a, an area of the property and have been re totally revamped and, and redone. And they are in, it's just phenomenal the work that the foundation down there has done with that property. As a matter of fact, they're going to be training the staff of the museum uh, next Thursday on how to use some of the things that they have to offer. We have a whole digital studio that we can do digital uh, production from and do cl remote classrooms from. Uh, we've got a fantastic library that's being uh, being added, a meeting space, and we're going to take one of the older houses um, and convert that into kind of a mini exhibit. On, on the property itself, on the Arsenal property. So a lot of great things going on down there and the uh, process continues to, to raise funds for again, the, the finale of the project, which will be the new Civil War and Reconstruction uh, Center building that we would like to get built. So those things are moving along just great. I'd like to commend uh, Commissioner Bryan and the foundation on the work they've done. It really, it, it really looks fantastic. And I hope you all will get a chance to go down there sometime and take a look at it. So that's the pretty much my report. Again, we are excited about reopening. All the staff are getting back to work as far as uh, finishing work on new exhibits. And again, we will continue to focus on digital learning. One thing we've learned is that even though the museums will reopen, people are still really interested in learning from a digital standpoint. So we are continuing to do uh, digital lectures and uh, create more digital content from all of our museum statuses to again educate people in the history of our state. But we're again very pleased to finally be able to get back to somewhat a normal life with reopening the museums. If you have any questions, please let me know. And now our director of the Division of um, Historical Resources and the Assistant State Historic Preservation Officer, Ramona Bartos. Good afternoon, everyone. Mr. Chair, Dr. Cherry, Commission members, I'm very pleased to be with all of you and also to see all of my colleagues uh, who we all 
communicate in this in this Zoom or Teams method now. So I'm very glad to be visiting with you this afternoon. Uh, I believe you've already received my report, so I'll just hit the highlights here. But I just want to emphasize again our uh, 50 plus, 60 plus strong team. Uh, we have continued to do the good work that we're trying to do for all of our neighbors in North Carolina. Uh, we have never closed for business as the rest of us. Uh, we continue to do, do our, our, our best every day and uh, continue to contribute to the continuity of government. So we've changed, changed our methodology through some of these uh, technological means, but um, we're digitizing more, providing constituents with the materials they need that way. We are visiting with constituents uh, virtually. We have done a few site visits. They're very rare. They're really conducted when we have a mission critical need to, to lay eyes on the site in particular, the property in particular. Um, but that's really, I think, helping morale a lot because part of the strength of our division, I think, is the teamwork and collegiality that we have from visiting with our constituents and helping them in that personal manner. Um, but we're doing the best we can in that regard. Um, a positive note too, is we have a lot of demand for our services. Uh, hearing, hearing our state archivists talk about the, the clamor for the training, we're seeing a similar uh, manifestation, one for uh, our environmental review services. Our branch is seeing record numbers of submissions and that's usually, um, it's, it's barometer, if you will, of sort of the strength of the economy or at least in various sectors of the economy. So in real estate development, infrastructure uh, projects, energy projects, State of North Carolina is continuing to do work in all of those areas. And I also want to thank, uh, cannot help but thank uh, our human resources department. We received a few exemptions to try to hire some very critical positions in the meantime, and we were allowed to do so and have filled those, which is really helping with our constituent service at this point. Um, our National Register Program likewise continues to have a great demand for its services, and we're really trying to make an effort to continue our momentum with review, um, particularly in the situation that we're in. Um, so we're really hoping to have a banner October meeting. We had to postpone our June meeting to August. We're going to have October on reg as our regularly scheduled meeting. And then February of next year, we'll see if that's going to be a virtual meeting or not. Uh, but we hope to have 10 or so nominations and potentially 20 coming in February. So for those of you who are on National Register Advisory Committee doing double duty, stay, stay tuned. We'll have you busy here in the next few months. Um, we've also changed um, because of term limits. Uh, we've welcomed two new members, Fred Belladin, who is an architect based in Raleigh, and also David Burkstone, who's an architectural historian who uh, was formerly with Old Salem. He's based in Winston-Salem. And the new chair is Dr. Alicia McGill, who is a professor in the public history program at NC State. Like the environmental review branch, our um, restoration branch has lots of demand from constituents for our services. Uh, and as you know, that's how we help to facilitate reuse of abandoned or underutilized buildings through both the federal and the state historic tax credit program. And so um, it's very interesting. We looked to see what had happened in 2019 versus this year. Again, trying to look for, for some kind of barometer of, of what's going on economically in the state. So in 2019, April, May, June, that quarter, we saw about $35 million in 2019 of proposed or actual investment in buildings. We saw 112 million uh, in that same time period earlier this year. So that's, that's really quite amazing. And I just wanna highlight, you know, a lot of what we're seeing in terms of, of projects, some of which are real game changers for communities. We sort of, I, I always see it as sort of a, a trickling down and this is true in other states as well. You see the big metro areas having a lot of activity and then it goes to sort of the regional tier communities, and then it co goes out to more of the, the smaller rural communities. And we're seeing that happen in North Carolina, which says a lot about how robust this kind of um, rehabilitation work has been statewide. And so Elizabeth City, we have 
Um, market rate apartments, downtown Elizabeth City, they're almost fully rented out from what I understand. And that has happened since COVID. So that, that tells you a lot right there. Uh, we also have a, an old cotton mill on the outskirts of town that's being discussed as a potential project in the future. Um, Farmville, we've seen the old railroad station and also the old opera house be turned into something new. Hendersonville, Franklinton, Wilson, um, Clayton, Eden, um, some of the mills are coming on board in the old spray section so forth in Eden. Uh, and out west, we're seeing uh, hospitals turned into uh, workforce housing in Waynesville. So this is really exciting to us. And, and again, we're seeing a lot more activity, sort of repeat customers or repeat communities in some of these, these smaller tier uh, markets. So that's really exciting. Um, Sarah Kuntz talked about some of the training they've been doing. We've, we've uh, shifted our in-person training for local government commissions to an online um, uh, venue. And I really want to thank Matt Zayer and Tom Normanley and our media department for getting all of this uh, squared away for us. We've used Zoom, which has been recorded just like these meetings are, um, and they're out on YouTube. And um, I think in the in my report, I've included a link and you can go and watch these. We've had over 500 people watch some of them. Uh, and we have not widely advertised those beyond just the con commission constituency, but I really uh, welcome your viewing as well. And uh, we've done architectural history. Um, I did one on the enabling legislation for local preservation commissions. We're very appreciative of our colleague, Angela Thorpe, who recorded one for the African-American Heritage Commission. And now it can then in turn help local preservation commissions with their work. So we, we invite you to look at those. We have six new topics, and I think we're gonna continue this even after COVID, because I think it's a great way for us to, to reach even more people. Um, the big thing too I wanted to tell you about is, and you'll be hearing some more later this month, and my thanks to Parker Backstrom for getting uh, our meeting squared away. On the 23rd, I believe, we're going to have um, you vet out and give us feedback on some recommendations for subgrants. We have we've been running a subgrant uh, program for our our special Hurricane Florence and Michael preservation recovery uh, program that uh, Congress has appropriated to us. We got over 17 million, and so our subgrants are about 9.25 million, eight and a half. We we earmarked for bricks and mortar and 750 thousand for planning projects. So we've been busily working on the staff review of those this week and uh, hope to have some information to you soon through Parker Backstrom. And uh, we're really excited. We've had very strong projects uh, widely dispersed, uh, especially Eastern part of the state because that's where a lot of the lingering damage was. Um, we're also adding two helpers to that staff. Uh, Dan Becker, who, who is our Hurricane Grants Manager, uh, now has an administrative and preservation specialist as well as an architect, a part-time architect to come on to help our constituents with that as well. Um, I also want to congratulate um, my colleague, Michelle Lanier, who was joined with Their Culture, uh, who has come out with the wonderful My NC from A to Z book. If you haven't seen that, um, you're really missing a great treat. Um, a wonderful book. That book, as well as our Grand Illusions, which is the historic interior decorative painting, more preservation oriented book that uh, architectural historian Laura Phillips did uh, last year. Both of those have been recognized this year, both coming out of our historical publications unit. Uh, again, in collaboration on my NC from A to Z with Angela Thorpe and the African American Historical Commission. Both Grand Illusions and my NC from A to Z were recognized by the Library Journal as 2019 notable documents. So we're really excited to have that kind of recognition for what we're, uh, I think, rightly proud of as really great publications. Also, the Highway Marker Program um, is sort of in a a suspended status at this point because NCDOT does not have the funding to uh, underwrite the program at this point, as we understand. Um, but we're continuing to monitor all the maintenance needs and there are many, um, and also asking for their assistance um, with damaged markers. Uh, so the other thing that might not be surprising is we've had a great deal of public interest in markers what subjects are marked, how those subjects are treated in our very, very, very pithy, they're almost like haikus, history haikus. Um, and some of the markers that we're talking about are decades old. 
And so the requests as far as updating markers and so forth are governed by part by a provision of our administrative code, state administrative code. But on the in, in-house side of things, we are going through and reviewing and assessing the marker essays, which are not governed by that same code um, in the same regard and making an effort to make sure that they reflect truly the full story of whatever the subject, whether it be an individual or an event, whatever that particular subject is to make sure that we are being honest brokers and telling the full story um, and updating those as necessary with additional information. So at this point, I'm glad to answer any questions and I appreciate the opportunity to give a report to all of you. Thank you, Ramona. When, when Ramona mentions environmental review, she means for some of you who are new to the commission, that every time the state or federal government uh, has an undertaking in the state, her staff reviews it to make sure that it does not have an adverse effect upon a historical resource built or an archeological resource that may still be in the grant. And every time a private uh, individual or institution uh, has an undertaking that requires a federal permit or uses or federal funds or a state mm -hmm. permit or state funds, her staff, all, they have to review to make sure that the historical resource and the archeological resource are protected when those undertakings are carried out. So 90% of the time, that means that her staff looks and says, no, nowhere near anywhere. No, 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 very near anywhere. But the 10% of the time can be a good bit of research. And maybe 2% of the time, it is really in-depth research. So um, it is a lot of work when you think about how many federal and state permits are uh, people have to get across the state. Dr. Cherry, to, we're running about 5,000 projects a year and we're, we're averaging the last little bit, 80, couple weeks, we've had 100 projects in one week and we have 30 days to respond. So um, it's all hands on deck. Right. All right, so our final report comes from the Director of State Historic Sites and Properties, Michelle Lanier. Good afternoon. I am so grateful to be with you all. Uh, I want to start with gratitude. Um, this time since we last met has been unlike any time I've ever seen as a public humanities professional. And it's the determination to show up and, and be collegial of people like uh, Dr. Kevin Cherry and, and Ramona Bartos and Ken Howard and Sarah Kuntz and their team um, that's really been, um, I think a really important aspect of being able to face such um, cataclysmic times. I also need to thank all of Angela Thorpe's work, Angela Thorpe for all of your hard work, as well as um, your team. Um, not only have you provided us with important critical partnerships, but I was just thanking you today for um, how amazing your um, bi-monthly newsletter is, I find information in that newsletter that I can immediately send to my staff so that we can lean into um, a focus that is increasingly important. And so that focus that I am referring to um, has been inspired by uh, the international uprisings of, you know, of outrage over the killings of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and the shooting and now uh, paralysis of Jacob Blake. Uh, George Floyd born uh, in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And it's so important that we, uh, the memory keepers of this state, call out the name of a man whose death has rocked the entire globe. And Jacob Blake, who was raised in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, our division staff have collectively leaned in to discern the strongest and most sustainable ways that we can honor this work um, of Black Lives Matter movements and any other equity and justice movements um, that are working to dismantle oppressions. And we are increasingly asking ourselves, how can we work to dismantle the oppressions that show up um, in public history and what we write, the stories we tell, and what has been ignored in the past. 
Um, we are in a shared moment. We're in a pandemic. We are in hurricane season. We've had an arson fire at historic Sagville. And we are in, as you all know, an economically fragile time again during a racial uprising. But somehow we go on. And I can only tell you that we are stronger. We have grown stronger. We've grown, grown more creative. We've grown more innovative um, as we work to reach our people, uh, to reach each other. So somehow even in July of 2020, we had, because of the, peculiar, the peculiarity of North Carolina State Historic Sites, not just having museum spaces, but grounds, thousands of acres of land, waterways. Um, we had almost 140,000 visitors in July of this year alone who were visiting our outdoor resources. Um, that is down from last year, but nowhere near where it would be um, had we not had these uh, outdoor resources. I wanna highlight for you all that we are busy distributing PPE across the state regularly to protect our staff and um, our constituents. We are delivering technological equipment to increase digital engagement, ranging from GoPro cameras and Zoom audio recorders and webcams. And we did just receive, um, as Ken Howard mentioned um, in his report, we also received a North Carolina Humanities Council NC CARES grant, um, which will allow us to purchase a drone to help highlight the land that I mentioned. Our deputy director is effecti effectively acting as our chief preservation officer for the division and his efforts to streamline major issues from leasing properties to aligning with compliance requirements with our friends in the preservation and state property office have been huge work and we really thank him for that. I do have to um, share with you with full transparency, our staff are showing signs of personal and professional overwhelm. Um, they have been on the front lines of uh, receiving guests and visitors to our sites for months now. And there is certainly a great deal of upheaval and uncertainty. And so it's been um, really important for us to encourage compassionate management at every level of our organizational chart. Um, and in, in addition to work-life balance strategies that we're increasingly um, encouraging, I've also been hosting a virtual open table to make myself available, just to listen, to discuss issues ranging from you know, stretch, stress management to race relations and how they impact our work. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about several emergencies that we've responded to. So on June 1st, a fire was deliberately set at the Cameron Benahan house, um, which damaged the parlor. It would have been much worse had we not had a functioning smoke detector there. And had we not had um, a volunteer fire force from Bahama, North Carolina in Durham County, who had a personal connection to historic Stagville um, and they quickly uh, got to the scene. Um, we also implemented what I would call a culturally uh, responsive approach to recovery and that we invited descendants of the enslaved African-Americans of Stagville and other local stakeholders and um, heritage practitioners to be with us in the midst of our recovery. Of course, social distancing was um, used, but they were a part of um, you know, observing the recovery process. They were a part of participating in some cases uh, in the volunteer cleaning of artifacts. I'm extremely proud of our team um, in collections uh, who uh, really showed, I think the highest level of professionalism and, and, and brilliance in terms of how they responded to that event. And then of course we were extremely um, grateful to our friends at the Museum of History, thankful to Ken Howard for sending folks over to help. And we had um, people come from across the department to support that moment. Um, there are um, artifacts uh, still in need of restoration that are being stored at the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum. Um, interestingly enough, this did not stop Stagville from just weeks after that event. 
um, hosting an extremely well-received Juneteenth um, event. So Tropical Storm Isaias um, resulted in outages for us down limbs and trees, major cleanup efforts at Brunswick Town and Fort Anderson, which also was impacted by several tornadoes. Um, and I am including uh, a quote from Jeff Barker that I'm hoping you all saw, but I just wanna read. He said, I plan on getting a work crew together um, for the, from the East region, uh, maintenance personnel in late fall or early winter to begin clearing the pond area. Right now, a mother gator and snakes are in the area, making it unsafe to work until cooler weather. So these are some of the things that our state, our staff has to deal with on a regular basis. Mother gators. gators. Yes, tornadoes, mother gators and tornadoes. It sounds like my memoir um, title has already been set for me. So we, um, as I mentioned, received a grant from uh, the North Carolina Humanities Council for a project um, that's about health, healing, and history, learning relevant lessons from North Carolina's historic sites. We believe that many of our historic sites can tell us something about pandemics. We often use the word unprecedented when we talk about COVID-19, but when in fact that is not the case, there, there have been um, a multitude of pandemics that um, our ancestors have survived um, and their stories need to be told. And so we have um, gotten some funding to help do that. So professional development is something that's extremely important to me. Because of COVID-19, uh, national conferences have turned into virtual conferences. We had a record number of 12 staff members to participate in the annual Association of African American Museums Conference. And many of them were presenting their work and their research. Uh, the conference featured Lonnie Bunch, uh, founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture and the first African American secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. I have just um, joyfully approved um, staff to attend two more virtual conferences that are extremely inexpensive and accessible. Um, economically, and those are uh, the Association, uh, American Association for State and Local History, uh, as well as SEMC, um, the Southeastern Museums Conference. We've talked a bit about the Golden Franks Freedom House. Um, we were, as we shared earlier, able to procure the entire household of objects. So there we have in my report the updated number 950 plus objects in addition to the usual household items, clothing, linens, china, glassware. It was such an honor um, to put on my face covering and deliver the, um, the payment to uh, the one child, the only child of Golden Franks for both the house as well as um, the artifacts. And we are truly looking forward to continuing the work um, that has begun. Uh, Dr. Terry helped us to find funding to um, purchase the house. And we're so thankful for that leadership as well as to purchase the artifacts and to get some of the repair work done, like having a new roof installed already, uh, a new HVAC system and insulation, groundskeeping equipment has been purchased. And we've also obtained condition storage for the artifacts. Uh, we are now moving into um, applying for grants that will help us do a really strong community engagement process around um, what stories we will tell. Uh, one thing that I want to emphasize is that we want to make sure that when we talk about Golden Franks, we talk about Mrs. Franks, that we talk about all of the work that um, Ruth Holly Franks did to support the movement. We know that oftentimes the women of the movement um, are eclipsed and we want to make sure that as we tell the story that it is balanced um, in, in terms of gender. Uh, we do have a, a brief report on the Confederate time capsule that was found in the cornerstone of the To Our Confederate Dead Monument that was erected in 1894. Um, that, was, that uh, cornerstone was moved to the um, Office of State Archaeology and with support from the Museum of History, as well as um, state archives um, and our collections team, and of course, archeology span took really all hands on deck to do a, a very sensitive process of sifting through what just looked like um, almost like chocolate pudding, muddy slurry. And some of the items that were found inside were bullets, a stone from Gettysburg, three small flags, a wooden box, horse and human hair, and three buttons. 
so cleaning and stabilization um, is ongoing. I want to mention a major initiative that we um, received a grant for, Singing on the Land. Singing on the Land is our gift to the people of North Carolina. Um, it's a way of saying we are here with you in this moment, and we want to offer not only comfort, but uh, an invitation to our landscapes that are historic for reflection and solace. Um, we were very intentional in partnering with the North Carolina Arts Council, particularly Carly Jones um, and uh, Sandra Davidson of the Arts Council to um, use the funding that was offered up by the Moore Charitable Foundation and uh, with fiscal agency from the Friends of Town Creek Indian Mound to create a digital uh, performance series. We have nationally recognized um, country music singer, the only the second black woman to chart on the country music charts, Reese Palmer, who went to Bentonville Battlefield and, and thought about her own enslaved ancestors and their pursuit of freedom during the era of the Civil War. Um, we had a uh, old time fiddler, uh, Jimmy Vipperman, who performed at Horn Creek, which is in Surrey County, uh, particularly well known for uh, Carolina string music. A bagpiper, Taylor McCullen, who performed at Elements, where there truly would have been a bagpiper. Um, we still have a few performances to record. Um, Carly Jones, who I mentioned before, is a classically trained um, vocalist. She'll be performing at Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum, and we will have a Cora um, player. This is really one of the antecedents to the banjo, and it sounds almost like it, the banjo and the harp had a baby. It's a very mystical instrument that griots use to tell historical stories, and Telly Shabu is a master Cora player, and he will be playing at Somerset. We also have American Indian representation with Lakota John, a Lumbee blues singer, and Arnold Richardson, who is Halawasa Pony um, and um, plays a traditional flute. All of them were recorded with the beautiful land of our historic sites as the backdrop. And we are so grateful to the marketing department for um, Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. They're putting a package together that will hopefully go live, start to go live and be, um, we will roll out over the next few months, but look for the first couple of recordings to come out uh, around September 23rd. So I am gonna wrap us up. Uh, First Lady Kristen Cooper asked uh, the new site manager, Lacey Wilson of the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum to do a social media takeover to help illuminate uh, that museum. Uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, one of their affiliates created a, a, or applied for a grant successfully to get Alamance Battleground, some iPads to help with more digital engagement. Of course, the year of the woman continues with the state capitol having been lit for two consecutive nights um, in August and with staff presenting on the history of women's suffrage as a part of the State Office of Human Resources um, commemoration of the anniversary of women's suffrage. I'm also extremely proud as a part of our true inclusion focus to really be as inclusive as possible in what we do and how we do it, that Fort Dobbs will begin working with a tribally enrolled heritage specialist to support a more expansive and inclusive interpretation of the site through the, from the perspective of American Indian communities. Um, I also want to answer a question that Commissioner Denard had it's under my old business um, report. So um, Commissioner Denard asked about the death threat um, that was received and reported on, that was received by Golden Franks and that was reported on in our last meeting. And so um, the information that we include is from a conversation that took place with Golden Franks on August 25th of 2020. So at one point between 1960 and 64, an anonymous white segregationist left a dead rabbit with a note attached on the porch of Golden Franks home in Edenton, North Carolina. The note informed Franks that he would end up dead like the rabbit if he continued his civil rights activism. To protect himself and his family, Franks purchased a shotgun and kept it in his home. He eventually disposed of the gun after his wife expressed discomfort with it being in their house. Because Dr. Wells was attending Hampton University at the time, she was notified of the threat via her parents. 
Um, so I wanted to make sure to share that. I've also included as an attachment, an open letter that I wrote from my own personal perspective about what it means to be a memory keeper in the age of Black Lives Matter. Um, I hope that you've had a chance to read it. We did distribute it through all of our websites, all of our social media and all of our support groups. Thank you for listening. Yep. Thank you, Cherry. This is David Ruffin. Uh, <clears throat> I feel almost uh, at every time we gather uh, an obligatory thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the division directors and their respective staffs for the incredible amount of work that they do. And I'm struck particularly by two things. One, uh, Ramona Bartos comment that we've never closed for business. And what that really tells me is you've done a remarkable job of, of, of evolving through this COVID environment. And I hear that theme to virtually every one of the division directors, um, not missing a beat. And I, I work around industries that have been so overwhelmed by the ubiquitousness of this uh, event that they feel almost it's beyond their control. That certainly has not been uh, the, the theme of, of the division directors or their staffs, apparently. And I also, Michelle Lanier, want to thank you for bringing up the issue of fatigue. And um, some people have even said a lot of people are living in Zoom fatigue yeah. <laughs> right now. But my point there is yours is far more substantive and far more, um, you know, needing our awareness, empathy, and so forth around the, the sacrifices that are being made uh, to continue the great work. But So I do, on, on representing the entire commission, want to express a, a huge amount of thanks and appreciation to all of you for everything you're doing. And I think that with that, uh, Dr. Cherry, uh, I'll turn it back to you for comment or two on them. We have heard from our division director, so mine will be very brief. I just want to begin by saying that we have the very best public history agency, uh, state-based or otherwise, in the United States. And you can see why when you see our leaders here who are doing such good work, keeping their colleagues inspired and on track and productive. So. I really, really appreciate all of their work. So, and so very quickly, three minutes worth. Some of you may have seen that uh, a member, uh, one of the institutions of the Office of Archives and History was featured on national, international news yesterday. They have their own governing commission, but they are a member of the Office of Archives and History and that's the battleship. They're what they um, managed to survive a presidential visit, which is not an easy thing to do, and the, the ship looked great on television. Um, as far as budget, um, we are currently operating under the state, same state appropriation we had last year. And this, I think, is a good thing, but depending upon changes in future revenue from the state, this may change, but we hope not. As most of you know, that our institutions require both appropriations and receipts to be successful to pay our bills. And receipts are all those funds that come to us outside of appropriation, donations, admissions, tickets, rentals, uh, any way, that, special tours, any way that we can generate funds other than appropriation. We have been closed, uh, the interiors of our places have been closed, even though we have been open, working online and not stopping and, and still serving people. But the parts of our institutions that generate receipts uh, have been closed since March. So that makes it very difficult for us financially. Um, this afternoon, the legislature, uh, well, the, the governor's office and the legislature worked together to try to help uh, our institutions that depend upon receipts a great deal. We, all of our institutions need receipts but some of our institutions need receipts to stay open, to stay afloat. And the governor's office and the legislature worked uh, together to help a little bit uh, keep, to keep us open. And they did this by redirecting federal funds, the COVID money that came to the state. And um, it passed this afternoon and has been sent to the governor for his signature. Um, but in those funds, Tryon Palace, 
uh, which has to receive 50% of its budget from receipts and volunteer hours, um, will be receiving uh, $1 million to the Trine Palace Foundation. Those monies will help the found, uh, Trine Palace remain open as we uh, go forward in the spring. The Transportation Museum, which has to receive, which has to generate 92% of its budget, and it's, the budget is around $4 million a year, um, the Transportation Museum Foundation will be receiving $1.5 million. And then the Museum of History Foundation uh, is receiving $1 million to help with the entire museum's division. Now, when I said that all of our institutions need receipts, some need those receipts more than others. Our smaller institutions, uh, with some help from our larger institutions, can can survive on appropriations. So we are very grateful for these funds. Uh, they will not uh, help us with our all of our needs, but they will help us a great deal. And so we're thankful to everyone in the governor's office and to the folks in the legislature who thought of us to, to make these funds uh, available to us. Um, we did have some vandalism, and we, you've heard about what happened at Stagville. We do not know how or if the vandalism at Stagville was related to the protests at all. We think probably not. It was just circumstantial. But in addition to what happened at Stagville, the front windows of the State Archives State Library building uh, were broken out, and flares were thrown into the building. The Museum of History saw some damage to its glass doors and to a vehicle. The Thomas Wolfe Visitor Center in Asheville had some damage to one of its glass uh, windows or doors. And we received some online threats to other of our institutions, some of them more credible than others, quite frankly, um, but uh, nothing more than online threats. Um, we are going forward with our planning for the 250th. We have two foci for the, the 250th anniversary of the creation of the United States. One of them is the traditional revolutionary North Carolina, and we have a great deal of activities lined up for that. And the other theme is when are we us, with us standing in for the United States, where we will look at those ideals that we hold up as American ideals and then examining when we have lived up to those ideals or not and who has been left out of those ideals. We do not have as much planning along that second theme as we would like. We were just getting started with that when our world changed a little bit with COVID, but we're going to go back on that. We hope to involve a, a very broad cross-section of uh, North Carolinians in that planning for the second um, theme, especially people who may be from ethnic minorities or um, immigrant communities who have not been uh, in North Carolina uh, all that long, but still are a part of North Carolina and a part of the United States and share those uh, famous American ideals. So that is my report. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. All right, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Cherry. We've reached the end of our published agenda. There's one little aside. Uh, as Ramona Bartos acknowledged that there will be a September 23rd meeting of the Historical Commission to consider the approximately $9.2 million in uh, hurricane relief uh, subgrants that will be presented to the commission uh, for uh, discussion. And unfortunately, you know, as chair, I'm not able to be here. Uh, this will be the first time in six months I'm being asked to actually travel for what I do. And Kevin understands I speak a lot to trade groups and this particular one is actually holding an event in a rural area of upper Michigan. So they're good, good friends of mine from a business perspective. So I'm going and it, it hits right literally on that day. So it would be very difficult to do that. So what I'd like to do is appoint uh, Dr. Valerie Johnson as temporary chair for that meeting. Um, and uh, hopefully there's no issue with that. And, and certainly my best wish wishes to you as a <clears throat> commission for a good meeting on the 23rd of September. With that, I um, 
will entertain a motion for adjournment. I move we adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Harry Morrison seconds. I, 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 there were so many that said adjourn at the same time. <laughs> that probably says more than I'd like to recognize. But my point, <laughs> the, my point there is I think I heard Commissioner Dr. Denard make the motion and Commissioner Morrison to second the motion. Uh, and, uh, we again have to do one more roll call because of uh, it is uh, a procedural under the current statutes for emergency meetings. Um, Dr. Bryan. Yes. Mr. Dixon. Yes. Dr. Denard. Yes. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Dr. Lowry. Yes. Mr. Morrison. Yes. Mr. Reynolds. Yes. Ms. Phillips. Yes. I know Ms. Snowden has probably left by now. Uh, Mr. Waters. Dr. Waters, excuse me. Dr. Waters. He may not be with us either, and David Ruff and I, so it, it does carry. And again, thank you all for your rapt attention today, and uh, in uh, all importance, stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.